Hi guys, Olive here. Today I am here to talk to you about some of the books that I picked up at a recent booktuber meetup that I went to. The first weekend in August, I met up with some amazing booktubers. Kate from Kate Howe, Stephanie from That's What She Read, Emma from The Bookish Princess, and Rebecca from The Book Nester. We visited two amazing bookstores, had some great book shopping, some great conversation, had a wonderful lunch together. It was an absolute blast. It was my first booktuber meetup and it did not disappoint. I had so much fun with these ladies. I will link all of their channels down below. If you have not heard of any of their channels before, you should definitely check them out. I will also post links to the two different bookstores that we went to. So if you live in New Jersey or are kind of near New Jersey, I urge you to check them out. They both were fabulous. So needless to say, I bought quite a few books. And then also during that trip, I brought home two more books from my best friend. And then the weekend after, I picked up two books from an indie bookshop. So I'm just going to compile them all into this one haul. There are lots of books to talk about, so I'm gonna get started. The first bookstore we went to, which I'm pretty sure that one was called The Book Garden, was absolutely jam-packed with amazing nonfiction. And I was definitely like a kid in a candy store. They had a huge section of books on Russia, a lot of which I did not already have, which was surprising and upsetting, so I had to fix the problem. The first book I got was The Flight of the Romanovs. This one is by John Curtis Perry and Konstantin Pleshikov. This is a book about the Romanov family as a whole, not just the Romanovs who were reigning in Russia at the time, but the whole extended family. I think the book starts talking about the family from the time when Alexander III was a child and goes all the way up to 1960 when the last Grand Duchess died. Especially after reading the Romanovs, the final chapter, I am much more interested in learning about the greater Romanov family, the members that I don't know as much about. So I think this one is going to be very, very interesting for me to read. The next book I picked up is Alexander II, The Last Great Tsar by Edvard Radzinski. Alexander II is one of the most famous Tsars. He was the liberator of the serfs. He was assassinated by the People's Will Movement, about which I read in the biography of Lenin's brother called Lennon's brother. I'm really surprised I didn't own this one, especially since this is by a bigger name in Russian history. Edvard Radzinski has written a lot of good books on Russia. So I am, of course, excited to add this to my collection. I got a lot of good biographies at this bookstore, including Catherine the Great by Simon Dixon. Of course, I have read Robert K. Massey's biography of Catherine the Great, but this is one that I had not read yet. I love the simplicity of this cover. I can't get enough of Catherine the Great. I'm just fascinated by her history, her personality, everything about her just absolutely enraptures me. So I am looking forward to giving this one a read. Yet another biography, one I didn't even know was out there, is Peter the Great by Derek Wilson. Now this book is very short, especially given how complex Peter the Great was and how much happened during his life. Just to put it in perspective, this is Robert K. Massey's biography of Peter the Great, Derek Wilson's. One of these things is not like the other. I will be interested to see and then to tell all of you guys if it is more approachable than a 900 page biography. I'm assuming it will be, but of course you're gonna lose a lot of the juicy detail. But I guess we'll see how much this book has since I know a lot of the juicy detail from this book. <laughs> so those were all the biographical books on Russia that I got. All the rest of the books relating to Russia deal with Russia as a whole. The first one being The Face of Russia, Anguish, Aspiration and Achievement in Russian Culture by James H. Billington. As you may have noticed in the first part of my bookshelf tour, which I will put a link to down below in case you missed it, I have a lot of books by James H. Billington. He writes a lot about Russian culture, but for some reason, I did not have this one yet. On the back, it says, in the face of Russia, renowned scholar and US librarian of Congress, James H. Billington explains how Russia's rich tradition of art, spirituality, and culture has affected the country's political processes and its struggle toward democracy. Through profiles of Russia's supreme practitioners of art and culture, Billington has identified a recurring pattern in the Russian creative process. Of course, I wanna know what that recurring pattern is. I'd love to learn more about art in general, specifically Russian art. So I am thrilled to own this one and definitely will pick this up in the future. 
Along similar lines is Between Heaven and Hell, The Story of a Thousand Years of Artistic Life in Russia by W. Bruce Lincoln. W. Bruce Lincoln is also another big name in Russian historical writing and Russian cultural writing. How did a country with such a tormented past bring such stunning works of art into being? To answer this question, W. Bruce Lincoln explores 10 centuries of artistic endeavor in a land uniquely suspended between East and West, past and future, sacred and secular. Surveying art in all its forms between heaven and hell tells the story of Russia's greatest novelists, poets, painters, composers, dancers, architects, and filmmakers as they struggle to extract beauty from their nation's painful life and shape the masterpieces that the world now acclaims as purely and uniquely Russian. I love everything about that synopsis. I love to read things about how the Russians see themselves how they express themselves. So I think this one is gonna be a real treat. Next we have East of the Sun, The Epic Conquest and Tragic History of Siberia by Benson Bobrick. I feel like the title summarizes what this is going to be about. I don't know much about Siberia specifically. I know things about Siberia as they fit into the greater aspects of Russian history, but I have of course never read anything specifically about Siberia. So I think this will be very interesting to read. It is a part of the world that I feel like is not often talked about. And the last book on Russia is After the Collapse, Russia Seeks Its Place as a Great Power. This was written by Dmitry K. Symes. This is a book about what is now being referred to as great power politics in Russia, where Russia was considered a great power when it was a part of the Soviet Union. But now that it is an independent country, it is no longer considered a great power. And the loss of that status has had a great effect on the Russian people and the way that Russian politicians behave. The problem is, is that Russia still wants to be seen as a great power. And a lot of other countries are not currently giving Russia the respect that they feel that they deserve in the international community. It kind of explains some of the power plays that Russia has been going after in recent years. A few years back, I almost did my honors thesis on Russia's great power politics and how it was affecting their international relations with other countries. I ended up going in a different direction, but obviously if it was something I was considering doing my thesis on, it was something that did and still does very much interest me. Both of the bookstores that we visited during this booktuber meetup had amazing nonfiction sections. And I don't know what it is, but I've been more drawn to nonfiction lately, which I guess is convenient with nonfiction November around the corner. But I picked up some amazing, amazing looking works of nonfiction. The first one I'd like to tell you about is called Out of Eden, An Odyssey of Ecological Invasion by Alan Burdick. This is a book all about invasive species. So a species that is indigenous to one area through some means or another, normally by means of something to do with humans. So a species that, you know, catches a ride on a boat to another continent and then slowly starts to populate in that area, that's considered an ecological invasion where a foreign or an alien species comes to another area and starts taking over. We see this in many different instances and it poses a real threat to the natural biodiversity of that area because a foreign species comes and starts to take over. This is a thing that I think a lot of people don't think about. I don't think your average everyday person understands or realizes the implications that come along with people and goods moving all over the world, that you can have these little stowaways that come to a new area and then threaten the entire biological system of that area. I had no idea there was a whole book on this until I saw it on the shelf. I am so glad I eyed it. I am so interested to read more about this. Another nonfiction book I picked up is called Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of the American Community by Robert D. Putnam. I don't remember what class it was in, but I know it was some class in either college or high school where the teacher slash professor told us about this book and I have wanted to read it ever since. This is a book about how civil society or sense of community has greatly deteriorated in American culture over the years. The reason why this is called Bowling Alone is that bowling leagues, specifically, I think it is in the 1960s, were extremely prolific and were a way to bring the community together. 
Other ways in which the community got together would be like the Junior League or the PTA, anything that brought together neighbors within the community to strengthen communities. Nowadays, we really don't have those kinds of bonds with our neighbors anymore. American culture is much more isolated than it used to be. I believe, and I'm guessing it is the author's belief as well, that that weakens our culture as a whole, that we need to be reaching out to one another and having open lines of dialogue and discussing our ideas with each other, so especially given the tumultuous political situation in the United States right now. This is one I'd like to pick up sooner rather than later. Another very important one that I'm hoping to read soon is called a Continent for the Taking, The Tragedy and Hope of Africa by Howard W. French. Speaking of things I remember from school, I remember very clearly from some time in grade school, I could not have been very old, but I remember our teacher pointed out to us on a map how clean cut the lines were that divided countries in Africa. And then she showed us a map of the United States and showed us, for the most part, how the lines that divided the states were very ragged. They're not completely straight. They kind of go all over the place. They sometimes follow natural borders or evolved over time based on different agreements between people over who owned what. But in Africa, it almost looks like someone took a ruler and just drew a line separating big hunks of land from one another. It looks that way, because that's what happened. That is what the great European powers at the time did with Africa. They divided it up amongst themselves and whatever was contained within that landmass, they felt entitled to. French delineates the betrayal and greed of the West, often aided and abetted by Africa's own leaders that have given rise to the increasing exploitation of Africa's natural resources and its human beings. Coarse self-interest and outright greed once generated a need for the continent's rubber, cotton, gold, and diamonds, not to mention slaves. Now the attractions include offshore oil reserves and minerals like coltan, which power cell phones. Africa has always been a continent I've wanted to learn more about, and I think this is a really great place to start. I would love to, after reading this kind of generalized history on the continent as a whole, go into more specific countries and learn more about the people and the history. I feel like that's just very important for me to do. I got really, really excited when I first saw this next book on the shelf. It's called The Keys of Egypt, The Obsession to Decipher Egyptian Hieroglyphs by Leslie and Roy Atkins. I feel like I don't really need to explain what this book is about. I feel like the title does that for me, but this is about how Egyptian hieroglyphics were first deciphered. This happened during a wave of Egypt mania that swept over Europe shortly after Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798. I feel like everyone in their own way is really, really interested in ancient Egypt. I don't know how you could not be. It's just a fascinating subject. I have been included in that everyone is interested in Egypt statement. I love reading about ancient Egypt. And of course, I know things about hieroglyphics, but I never have known the story of how they were first deciphered. So I feel like this is going to scratch two witches at one time. Ancient Egypt and language. Love it. So this next one is the last nonfiction book that I picked up during the meetup. The very last nonfiction book I have is one that I picked up at the indie bookstore. But this one is called Fireflies, Honey, and Silk by Gilbert Waldbauer. Before I tell you what this book is about, this is one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen in my life. There is this beautiful cover, which is continued onto the back. Cute illustrations on the inside of the dust jacket. And then I don't know how well this is going to translate to film, but these end papers are embossed like honeycomb. And it is the most amazing looking and amazing feeling thing I've ever seen in a book. So now I should probably tell you what this book is about. This book is about the history of humans' relationship with insects. So it talks about products that are produced using insects, the appearance of insects in different cultural works, in art, in poetry, the medical uses of insects, basically about the entirety of humans' relationship with insects throughout recorded history. I think that sounds fascinating. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. It was in wonderful condition. I'm so happy I own this. The last nonfiction book I'm gonna talk to you about is the one I picked up at the indie bookstore. That's called How to Listen to Jazz by Ted Joya. I always really appreciate a straightforward title. I don't know if you know this about me, but I really, really love jazz music. Although I love jazz music, I am definitely not an expert. 
I appreciated at a surface level. And this book was written by a jazz expert who I am sure can give me more of an insight as to what makes good jazz music, what jazz music makes us feel, the different techniques used to create an amazing jazz song. I am just all about this book. Also at the indie bookstore, I picked up a fiction book, which follows the same theme as the last book. It's called Jazz Moon by Joe Oconquo. The blurb on the front, which was written by David Ebershoff, who is the author of The Danish Girl, says, a passionate, alive, and original novel about love, race, and jazz in the 1920s Harlem and Paris, a moving story of traveling far to find oneself. It seems like it's gonna be a lot different than other things I've read, which I am always, always up for. I'm really excited for this book. Next, my best friend sent me home with two books that she was looking to get rid of, so I figured why not? They are both very popular. There's The Kite Runner and A Thousand Splendid Sons, both by Khaled Husseini. I feel like these books need no summary. I feel like everyone has read them but me, and I will get around to it. These last three were ones I also got during the booktuber meetup, the first being Evelina by Fanny Burney. I am pretty sure I first heard about this book on Ron Litt's channel. By the way, I miss her terribly. But this is a very satirical novel. Fanny Burney takes kind of a bumpkin character and has her thrown into 18th century high society and the naivete of this main character trying to navigate her way through all of the social niceties and customs of that era shows just how absurd everything is. From everything that Ron said about this book and from everyone that I've heard talk about it since then, it sounds hysterically funny, very entertaining. This will be a great classic to sink my teeth into. Winding down here, only two books left, the penultimate one being Moontide by Dawn Clifton Tripp. This follows three different women from 1913 to 1938 in a coastal town in Massachusetts. I love books that have characters whose lives intertwine with each other. That's been a big theme of my reading over the past year. Plus, I thought the cover was very muted, very understated, very elegant. Definitely interested in checking this one out. And the very last book is Surrender Dorothy by Meg Wallitzer. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure what this specific one is about but I am a big fan of Meg Wallitzer's books. I really like her writing. I am okay going into this one blind. I'm not always okay going into books blind, but it's Meg Wallitzer, so I think it's a pretty safe bet that I'm going to enjoy it. So that's it. Those are all the books that I picked up at the booktuber meetup and since the booktuber meetup. I wanna say thank you to all the ladies that I met up with. I had such an amazing time with you. If you've heard of any of these books, if you've read any of them, or if you want to read them now that you've seen them in this haul, I would love to chat with you in the comments section below. Or if you would like to chat with me somewhere else, all the links to my social media profiles are in the description box below. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.